monumental miscellanea, and funerary paraphernalia. It's Archeodeath. Welcome to this uh, TikTok Live, which I'm going to transfer onto YouTube for posterity, for immortality, for the good of the land, for the good of the universe. This TikTok Live transfer to Archeodeath on YouTube will be discussing the Northman. Um, and uh, while people settle in and join me, I'm going to read, I'm going to set us off, get us in the mood um, by giving a little bit of story. So uh, because of lockdown and because of various other circumstances and uh, family related illnesses, uh, I've been avoiding all public events and all public places for a very long time, including the cinema. So this is my first time back at a cinema for four, four and a bit years and finances and things. You know, and also because of crap movies. But I, I thought I'd give it a go. And I thought I'd go to watch The Northman, given that it's the latest incarnation of our our journey, our 21st century journey into a new Viking Age revival, a Viking revival that we're experiencing of the last 20 years of interest in um, early medieval Northern Europe and the Vikings in particular. And it's part of a, a revival that has manifested itself in literature, comic books, video games manifests itself in uh, TV uh, shows and in um, films. But it's also manifests itself in archaeology, <laughs> in heritage sites, in, 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 in archaeological research, in the fact that our understanding of the Viking world has been transformed in the last 20, 25 years with new excavations, new surveys, new analyses of artefacts, new understandings of um, the people from the, the burials, from the settlement, from uh, tr uh, trade links, uh, from all of these different types of archaeological evidence. And I teach a third year course for my undergraduates called Vikings because it's a brilliant topic. It gets people interested in the early Middle Ages. And while I teach much more than the Vikings in the course called the Vikings, it's a, it's a great way in. It's a gateway. It's a gateway drug to the early Middle Ages um, and allows people to get into, get into that, uh, these conversations and understandings of, of how archaeology is transforming our understanding of the Viking Age. We're not going to get any more new saga literature uh, turning up. We're not going to get any new historical sources just coming into existence that we haven't found before. But we are getting rich archaeological discoveries and evidence. So, you know, that's why it's such an interesting topic to see the, the, the growth of Viking Age archaeology and the growth of, of global interest in the Vikings. The Vikings are not just for people who happen to live in a country or community that that see the viking diaspora in its in its in its story in its history this is, the vikings is for everyone from from chile to new zealand to alaska you know to newfoundland to uh, europe africa you know everywhere has exposure to this through marvel films through you know stories uh, through american gods uh, you know assassin's creed valhalla yeah so vikings is a big thing so I had to when I, I had to go and see this film. I had to go and see this uh, The Northman, and I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming because um, people obviously were hyping it and promoting it, and also because there was a large amount of academics talking BS about it. <laughs> you can usually tell when a new film's coming out because people start judging it before it's even been released. And one of the, the things to say before. I get started on my review of the Northman is that I, I was already sort of braced by seeing various um, self-appointed mouthpieces on social media um, passing judgment over the film based on the poster alone. And I was like, oh, no. And uh, people implying all manner of failings of the film and problems of the film based on things like the way the fact they are using a runic, this runic script. A, f a false runic script was used to make out the words the Northman. And obviously that is uh, a modern sort of, you know, Roman alphabet, but adapted. And that apparently was um, a wrong. And the fact that you have a lead actor with his, his shirt off was apparently um, something worth criticising in and of itself. So, you know, while we laugh at this, we, we academics do create their own problems sometimes and say silly things before the film has even been released. So I knew it was coming. And uh, I knew this was going to be a moment, a moment we can educate with. We can talk about the Vikings. We can reflect on the significance of the Vikings. And I don't know if you can see, just as another aside in the backdrop, I've got my, my little uh, uh, Isle of Man Viking there. Can you see my little Isle, Isle of Man Viking? This is Sandy. So you can buy him in um, uh, the Douglas Airport uh, 
lovely little, you know, Vikings are everywhere, aren't they? Um, so there, he's going to sit there uh, and just, just keep, remember, he's not going to, he's going to be listening to all of this. Um, you know, and it, it, it would be a good moment to discuss the Vikings. So first point, I've been reading some of the reviews. I've been watching Robert Eggers and uh, what's his name, Skarsgård, do their online YouTube gaff about what they think their film was about and how great it was. And I just want to start off by reading a review from The New Yorker, um, Richard Brody. And his, he, his review, which I thought it was recommended to me by a professor of archaeology. Who, I hadn't seen this until today. And his review says, The Northman reviewed just a bunch of research and gore. Robert Eggers' berserker epic collapses under the weight of its own aspirations towards authenticity. He says, and um, he finishes a, a rather, I mean, there's a few inaccuracies in his review, uh, but um, he finishes his review by saying, um, the North, um, instead of the roots of Shakespeare's play, the Northman merely serves up its raw material, both half cooked and overcooked. Ouch. And he starts off with the issue of authenticity. And he says, Claims to authenticity can be a ploy for cadging good reviews. When filmmakers trumpet the accuracy of their work, it's a sign that they're straining after praise on factual matters and attempting to foreclose critique of the film's aesthetics, its pleasure factor, or its emotional truth. In short, it's a kind of advertising. Robert Eggers has been emphasising every chance he gets the extensive research that he put into getting Viking stuff right in The Northman, reading, consulting prominent historians, and embodying his findings in the production design and reflecting it in the action, as if anybody but those historians would care much about the details. Wow, that's stinging. And he's right, but also he's wrong. And why he's, I think he's right is to say that well, I've, I've seen the historical consultants, uh, Johanna Katrin, Frederick Stottir and uh, Neil Price uh, give their accounts of their role. And it was extensive. And we should celebrate the, the, the attention and the efforts put into creating this rich, immersive material world. It also has to be said um, that it's not just up to the historians who care. A lot of people care beyond um, people care about this this detail, this immersive world beyond just the the the, the nerds, the 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 the, the, um, um, the 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 fantasists, you know, the 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 fanatics, the enthusiasts. You know, it's only um, it's it's not just um, uh, the experts that care. A lot of people care about this because we've inherited not only a lot of knowledge out there about the Vikings, about the Viking world from popular books, from heritage sites like Jorvik or National museums, local museums, you know, it's 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 in in our popular culture as I discuss, but but also because we've inherited a, a genre of film, a whole well, not a genre of film, a whole tradition of of films from the nineteen fifty eight epic with Kirk Douglas, Vivian Lee, etc., through uh, Outlander, Pathfinder, you know, the more fantasy Vikings, to these two big new TV shows, The Last Kingdom and Vikings now with its spin-off Vikings Valhalla. So people are not do care about how it looks, the material detail, because people do have, more than any other part of the early medieval world, they have a, a, a foot in the door. People do, you know, beyond the experts, people do care how these Vikings look. And they also care because many people base their faith in this period, their spiritualism, whether it's proto-Christian or it's pagan, um, and people fix their national identities, their ethnic identities in, in this period, too. So I, I'm, I'm totally agreeing with this rather snide take on the emphasis on authenticity uh, by Richard Brody in The New Yorker. But also, you know, well, both sides. I see both sides. I think he's right. But also I think he's being a bit unfair because people do care. And if you watch the videos by Rich, Robert Eggers and others, you know, they're, they're harping on about this, you know, a, 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 the accuracy. They've claimed it's the most accurate, the most accurate film about the Viking Age produced to date. And again, I would agree with that because I don't think there's been any attempt to do this in a film 
not in a TV show, in a film. I don't think there's been any previous attempt to create an accurate representation of the Viking Age at all. I don't think there's been any really serious en effort in any previous film in Hollywood. And I must, uh, that's, a, that's a, a proviso because I've seen some great uh, Scandinavian and Icelandic films, low budget, over decades that have produced films that are at least as accurate as, as, as The Northman. But I think this is the first time anyone's done a single film that attempts to be produce that detailed, rich material world from landscape from, down to settlements, buildings, costume, farm equipment, animal species and uh, domesticates, you know. It does create that material world. And my immediate reaction of going to the cinema was, yeah, I see where they got that idea. I see where they I see what they're doing there. Oh, yes, here we go. That's interesting. Um, but simultaneously, that was one side of my brain. You've got to imagine me like in Pirates of the Caribbean 3, like a two Johnny Depp sitting on my shoulders, sort of going, oh, I don't like that. And you know, one of them was going, oh, it's really good, that. And the other one was going, oh, a load of rubbish. And my other side of me was going, oh, my God, how did they manage to get that wrong? How did they manage to fluff that up? Because I felt that every scene had so much effort put into it, so much attempt to recreate a Viking universe, a material world, drawing on, and I say this Viking universe is multifaceted from base archaeological evidence, historical sources, later legendary and mythological accounts. It's trying to create that mix of the, the imagination and the Viking mind, as Neil Price loves to say it, and a, a real grim, stark world for people living in. And it, and it does that um, so well. And yet every scene I was thinking, but, 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 but how did they manage to fluff that up? And, you know, I, you could say this is a professor, isn't it? This is I'm, I'm overthinking it. I'm over. I'm ruining it for myself because I can't just enjoy a film like this. But I think people do care about what's right and what's wrong and how they put so much effort in. And I think still manage to fluff it up in some significant ways. So, I mean, I hope you give me some questions and I hope you give me some um, disagreement. You know, I've, I've, some of my good friends on TikTok have already said that they love the film and they, they, they really uh, they love the mashup of supernatural and, 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 and human world. They like the classic revenge proto Hamlet story um, going through in, into, into the fantastical, the idea of fate driving the characters. They love the action. They love the, the, the characters. But I must say, I just found the characters boring, uncharismatic. I didn't care what happened to them, which is, you know, um, there was no light relief. I, I, there was so much that I think was fluffed up. The language was stinted. I, I just I just thought it was dull. And and there were bits, there were many bits where I did laugh when I wasn't supposed to laugh, uh, including bits where people do the whole, I'm going to stop fighting and just go, ah, and, ah, and uh, some very comedy moments. Um, I will, in, I, 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 I'm, uh, some comedy moments where I thought to myself, you know, it's almost like uh, uh, the one I was saying to people about as a joke was the, um, the scene where Amleth has slaughtered some of the menfolk of the Icelandic settlement and he pins their body parts above the door of one of the halls, um, very much like happens to Grendel's arm in the Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf, the old English poem Beowulf, where, you know, the arm is pinned above the door as a trophy. They, they sort of take that idea and they pin all these body parts up so that everyone comes out in the morning and sees these body parts, you know, you know display. Who did this? What happened? And the, the eldest son, uh, who's a bit of a prick, sort of goes, who did this? Who murdered my friends? And he looks around the assembled farmstead inhabitants and he sees his dad and his and his mum he sees he sees his brothers and sisters he sees his his warrior retinue he sees these farmers these beggarly looking men and women who look like on the edge of starvation right and he and in the middle of all these like is his amleth meathead standing there going with the same facial expression of like this and it's almost like a sort of I don't know how he could work out who did the murders. You know, it's like a Poirot, can you help us, old chap? You know, or or good gracious Holmes, I never saw it was going to be him, elementary dear Watson. You know, like you know, it's like who else is it gonna be? He's standing there with his sort of muscles the size of the size of, you know, size of Norway, you know. 
<laughs> you think, who else could this be? So I suppose my point was there were some utterly ridiculously implausible moments. Um, yeah, so um, I've got to make an account for myself. So my immediate reaction, I came out of the cinema, I did a TikTok and said, there's nothing I liked yet. I revised my account and I said, there was nothing I didn't hate because I thought actually a lot of the points were deeply problematic. And then I, I said, I gave one example in a previous TikTok where I said, you know, the scenario of the king being completely alone at any time in which he could be... Uh, could be suddenly attacked and killed by people firing arrows it just doesn't play out so you know those are the kind of points that i thought that's a good example so let me get into some other ones because you can give you a list of what they did wrong i'm only an undergraduate I, 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 I but was very impressed well i think you should be very impressed because as i said i'm not saying the material world was pretty awesome and i can use I'm going to be able to use screen captures of this I'm going to be, as an educational tool, as I do with Vikings, because there's plenty wrong in the TV show Vikings, The Last Kingdom. But there's some really good bits to get students interested in discussing ideas. It's not about whether, you know, so I will use the Northman in that sense. But I will, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm only going, the other proviso is I'm only going for memory, but let's give it a go of what I remember that I think that just didn't make any sense. Right, okay. Should we talk about berserkers to start off with then? Let's talk about the warrior stuff, Yeah. So, you know, you have Amleth, he goes off and you don't see, and then, you know, you don't see what happens to him, but he rows off on his own into the, into the ocean and somehow no one spots him, you know, just, you know, he was in his red cloak, having hidden behind a rune stone, hidden in a tree bowl, he escapes and hides under a house, and then he just gets some, his mum's cloak over him and he just walks off to the, 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 the sea, gets in a boat, no one, no, one, no one says, oh, I wonder if that's the king's son getting away, you know, because the, the noseless man says, he, he drowned in the water, and everyone was, okay, fair enough, you know, that's utterly implausible, and, and he gets away, and then 20 years later or whatever, he's on the Russian river system, he's on the Volga or the Dnieper, and he's, he's rowing away, right, he's rowing away, right, and he's rowing away, right, and you think to yourself, okay, that's really dramatic, you see two boats going upstream, they've got their sails off, they're very high in the water, that's one thing I, I don't know. I'm not ship technology is not my thing, but I thought they were ridiculously high in the water. But anyway, they're high at these. These ships are being rowed upstream, and at the, the front of the first boat, you see a sort of Viking warrior woman. You see BJ five eight one lady who gets this cameo. Second boat is apparently uh, Eggers calls it in his video the uh, the berserker boat, and you sort of pan a wonderful shot. You pan over, and there's Amleth looking miserable as he does right the way through to his untimely. Uh, end of the movie right wherever you know i want to ruin the plot he, he's he's rowing away right and he's rowing away and there they all are rowing away and i'm thinking oh this is good this is really good that's that's kind of good and i'm thinking hang on where are they rowing to and this is like this is like what are they doing we're rowing like upstream against a current at at like at a pace as if they're being chased so i thought this was going to be a chase scene like um you know everyone me perhaps remembers the mission where you know the 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 Amazonians are fighting against each other and, you know, they're sort of, shit, get away on a boat, you know, and they're being fire as a fight. No, no, they're just, they're just rowing. They're just rocking along rowing, right? So, and I'm going, okay, they're going to die. I mean, I've seen people row on the, on the D and on the Thames in my time. Unless you're in a race, you're not going to row that quickly. You're going to absolutely be exhausted very quickly. Anyway, so I was, they're, they're rowing, right? They're rowing really fast, somewhere quick, right? Okay, so, and then, and then they just pass two fishermen who somehow, Somehow these two fishermen, the son and a father and son, are fishing in a little boat. And they hadn't noticed these two great war craft zooming slowly upstream because they're going against the current, going past them. And then one of the one of the berserkers, who obviously the idea is to show what absolute tossers they are, decides to um, pick them off with arrows. So I'm thinking, OK, right. Um, so they sh he shoots these two unarmed fishermen who weren't going anywhere to report their presence who weren't doing anything they were just and they somehow managed not to have noticed this boat go right past them and he shoots them and they die and he does a sort of half smirk of yeah oh, i'm just a psychopath who kills people and you're supposed and that's supposed to be badass or is that supposed to be because they um eggers is going on about how oh, we're not going to condone violence we're not going to celebrate violence but he's just killed two unarmed people so th these are and we're going to learn that these are supposed to be warriors with a code they're supposed to be champions a brotherhood of of warriors and they just have just slaughtered two people right and you face and, you, and and then the, i'm thought thinking okay so how's he going to get those arrows back what is this is this are these two boats of raiders like for 10 minutes they can pop back to their fortress and get another massive pile of arrows or you just thought i've got too many arrows here i'm just going to fire them you couldn't retrieve those arrows um so the arrows are more valuable than the bodies he's 
he was killed. And they were supposed to be slave raiders. So why didn't, he, why didn't they take them and hostage? And so that's the kind of thing that just immediately set alarm bells ringing. Of That was a nonsensical, out of historical context, killing. It was, it was to show the cheapness of human life, maybe, and the, the cruelty and barbarity of the Vikings, of raiders, you know, on the river, Russian rivers. But immediately it suggested to me that this is not to be taken seriously as a narrative. Even though every piece of clothing looked cool, every boat looked spot on as far as I could tell. I mean, I'm not an expert in all these areas of Viking archaeology. I'm just saying immediately that, that set up alarm bells. Right. So, OK, they're rushing somewhere quickly, but where they're not, they're not, they're not raiding a village by a river. You then have they spend all night then doing weird wolfy dances with um, headdresses on. And uh, they have then they've made the choice to suggest that the Torslunda plaques, which we have from the island of Irland in Sweden, representing a dancing naked warriors with a bird terminal headdress, is a representation of something people actually did. And this isn't the first time this has happened. And so you have the lead warrior naked, but for a loincloth, if I remember rightly, and he's got this kind of bird terminal headdress and he's got the, the crossed over spears which appears on other versions of the uh this this these dancing warrior images including the sutton who helmet from mound one at sutton who dating to the early 7th century probably a late 6th century danish product or south south scandinavian product you know and this is trying to render this in the early 10th century people in the early 10th century are literally trying to dress up like these plaques whether they're representing gods heroes mythical beings or whatever we have from the 6th 7th century in the 10th century they're doing this stuff that's what we're supposed to believe. Anyway, but that aside, they represent a group of berserkers. And the berserkers are supposed to be in this version of them. And there's great debate over that at this. And you need to read the work of Roderick Dale. He's brought a whole book out on the berserkers. There's been different ideas about the berserkers. Are they shamanistic warrior cult? Are they, are they just champions who kicked ass? Are they just the bad guys? Are they a later invention? You know, now, I don't want to go into all of that. But the version we see in The Northman is they've gone down the route that they're a band of brothers who are an Odin cult, and they act like wolves. They're the Ulfhedna. They are the, they are the, they are being the Ro Roderick Dale, D-A-L-E. Um, and um, he's done a brand new book on berserkers. And he's, in, you know, and he's told me, I can think I can say that, that, that he's quite happy with the representation of this as a, an Odin cult band of brothers who bond. And in this case, they're imitating wolves rather than bears. And they're dressing in wolf pelts and they're, they're, they're going to act like, like some kind of coordinated force of ferocious, armourless. You know, the idea is they're like shock troops. They're, they're fearless in a frenzy, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a rage, in a, in a frenzy. They, they're, 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 the, they're the shock troops to go in. They're stormtroopers, right? They're, they're going to go in, break up any, any shield wall and let the majority of the force do the rest of the work. That's the kind of scenario I think they're playing with the idea of, right? So they're elite warriors, they're in an Odin cult, they're mimicking the howls of wolves, they're mimicking wolf dress, and they're going to... They're, 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 they are tough warriors. They're, they're, they're trained for this. They're, they're, they're not farmers who have a day off. They're the, they're the ultimate Vikings, if you like. That's what they're playing with the idea of. I'm, that's not my idea. I'm just saying that's what they're saying, right? This is another thing. This is me. This is my interpretation of what they're trying to do. And this is just one interpretation of Ulfhedna and Berserkers. Right. But let's not go there. That, that's their version. Right. Um, and yeah. And, and so the idea is they, they're doing this. They're champions of the army. They're going to be the first in. And so. Right. So what's their battle strategy? If they're mimic, if they're in a northern ideology that are shamanistic and animistic elements where they are in a cult where they're taking on the, the mimicry and behaviors of an animal, a predatory animal, they hunt, they go hunting like a pack of wolves. I mean, I, I mean, I, I know nothing about wolf behavior, but I would imagine, I would imagine that if you're going to manifest that in a film, you have this weird nighttime fire, fire lit ritual where they're all getting psyched up. Then in the morning, their tactic, how this is then manifest in a tactic, is coming up to a settlement, a Slavic settlement, going within visual interaction, within eyesight, they're spotted, throwing off the wolf clothing, going, 
<laughs> catching a spear midair and then lobbing it back over some ludicrous distance, like Olympic javelin throwing. So that, 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 that spear was unlikely to do anything. And you just throw it back. And then you just run straight at a 10-foot palisade. Wow, this is exciting stuff. So you've they put all this effort into portraying. See, this is where I'm going with this. This is my this is where I'm going with this. They put all that effort into consulting with Neil Price and others about how we interpret the Ufthild Ufhedna. How do we interpret the berserkers? How do we interpret you know this this bear and wolf cult warrior imagining there? Maybe they're taking any hallucinogens or they're just psyched up. They're going into a rage. And then they're going to fight, but they don't coordinate. They don't coordinate. And they don't just think it's not that they're just running at the palisade. They then managed to they try to climb the palisade with axes. Now, wouldn't it have been better to put up some rudimentary ladders? But anyway, they, they climb up with bare muscle and, and axes while the inept defenders are somehow not able to pierce their completely unprotected flesh. Get onto the rampart and then. He jumps off the rampart onto some random dude who's riding a horse, who knows where, <laughs> and then goes on, a, on an absolute massacre of everyone in the settlement. All those valuable slaves, he's just massacring. He's just ripping them apart, killing all the warriors. No, he doesn't target the women. He's targeting the men, you know, targeting the, the armed opponents. And, you know, I'm sorry, the archaeologist in me says, well, there's a slight problem here, isn't it? Because like all historical films, you put all this effort into how they look, into researching settlements and fortifications, but you've forgotten one fundamental thing. Why would you put up a palisade without a ditch in front of it? Oh, Howard, oh, Howard, you know, you're being pedantic. I'm sorry, you, these are the people carping on about historical authenticity. They put all that effort into the boats, the weapons, the, the behaviours of warriors, they then have them just charge at a palisade and they forget to think that maybe there would be a ditch in front of it. Now, if there's one thing that archaeologists are good at finding, it's ditches. And we know that any defence, any palisade, any wall from, from the Neolithic right up to the modern age, the defence of any wall is it's irrelevant without a ditch, a moat, a, a palace, you know, a massive V-shaped or, you know, ditch with an ankle breaker and palace stakes in the bottom. So immediately I'm just going, well, that was silly, wasn't it? And I'm being rhetorical here, but what I would say is that give me a, give me a one primary school class of year sixes and I would have defended and killed all of those berserkers before they even got to the palisade. <laughs> Give me a bunch of 10 year olds, 11 year olds, you know, don't even need warriors. Maybe it's a surprise attack, Howard. You know, they didn't see it coming. Yeah, they did. They had a good two, three minutes to get ready. Those those berserkers would be mown hay. And you say, Howard, oh, well, it's just a film. It's just a film. Yes, it is just a film. It doesn't matter. None of this matters. But my point is, all of the rhetoric, all of the money, all of the talk has gone on this being authentic. Then why didn't you dig a ditch, get a JCB in, dig a ditch, put a palisade in it? Because that's what Vikings have done. Everyone's going, oh, it's so much more better than Vikings. I saw Robert Eggers say, oh, Vikings is rewriting history. We're doing the real history or something like that. OK, Robert, you know, you say that. That's fine. Your show is you put a lot of effort into historical accuracy. So where's the ditch, mate? Where's the ditch? Where's the ditch? And so, OK, you know, so you think, well, OK, you can take that or leave that as a criticism of the film. It doesn't ruin the film for me. It doesn't ruin the film. That wasn't the point that ruined the film for me. But it, it's blimmin' annoying when you think about the amount of investment they've put into that whole scene. So I've taken you on a little journey through one scene. And my problem was that Every scene did the same thing to me. Every scene was going, wow, they put so much effort into this, but what the heck? Uh, but why? How? How is, how is that working? Where's the ditch or the equivalent to that throughout? And, and you know, this, I mean, the berserk is getting slaves. Um, the question here, thank you for that, uh, Worrywart, if I can say, if I'm saying that right. 
Um, I don't know. I mean, yes, I suppose so. I mean, raiding for slaves is the big thing. And and Neil Price and others have commented that, you know, the, the representation of slaves is an important aspect of the film. And I think that's very true of enslavement, the process of enslavement, the the depersonalization, the callous treatment of slaves is is disturbing. And I think good, uh, good in the sense of appropriate to show the Viking Age. But it's not the first time that's been done. But but you know if you want to say that's a that's a, the win yes and and slaving um, slaving and raiding is is about slaving yes I think that's that's accurate to a degree why I mean then you say well why would they be taking slaves direct all the way to Iceland from the Rus river systems well well you know that just ruined it for me again I mean what the heck I mean really um, that's how many thousand miles I don't know but that's just that's nutty but. My point is, as a as a crude indication of the the Viking Age, capturing slaves locally, long distance, and transporting them um, in all different directions would have been a, a a a key part of what made the the Viking Age what it was. It was the movement of silver, slaves, furs, and other um, materials that we, um, probably including amber, salt, even. We know as hypotheses about salt being targeted by raiding and, and trade arrangements. So, you know, there's all sorts of things like that. But slaves and slave peoples were would have been a key element. Um, and the Vikings TV show has already done this. You know that this is nothing revolutionary. Um, so, again, I'm not quite sure why they think it's such a revelation. But, you know, they've made a big play of that. This being something new. But I, I'm not disputing it. Um, and so, yeah. And then the, the so we're in the settlement in the Slavic settlement. He's killed probably more people than you need to. And then I must admit, my memory goes a bit hazy because it just gets a bit confusing. I suppose the idea is that then Eggers, um, sorry, Eggers, um, Scott Scott's character is like, um, Amleth is like kind of, a, I've done my bit. I'm just going to rock around looking at everything else. And I thought that was very much a play to various war mi movies where you see like a, an individual character. who's not really invested. He doesn't want to, there's no win for him. He's just doing the job. And I, I thought that was really good actually. Um, but then he has his vision. But then he, they, they, they do a hall burning. And, I, and this is really interesting. They, they, I don't know who they're supposed to be burning in the hall. Are they burning the, the sick people, the ill people, the old people? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 yes, it's, it's, I'm doing a half job when you're being, if, you, if you're really playing this em emphasis on realism, there's always going to be gaps. There's always going to be holes. I'm not trying to say that there's ever going to be a perfection. But why, why do it? So why are they hall burning? Now, hall burning is the thing we know from the sagas and from... The, you know, the King sagas, the, you know, the legendary stories and also from the Icelandic family sagas. You, know, you burn, burn your enemies in a hall. But why capture people and burn them in a hall? I didn't understand that bit. It was horrific to hear the screams. And but why do that? Why do that? Um, it, and and the, the Viking BJ581 girl, she shouts something like, I only pick the healthy ones. And I suppose that's the idea is they're only going to take away the healthy slaves. But why massacre the rest? I don't understand what the point point is here. I, I don't I, I don't understand enough. I, I mean, this is my area. Of, I don't maybe that's convincing. I, I don't know. But it seems to me if you are you're, if you're a slaver, you want to leave people behind as the basis of a future raid. You know, as a you don't want to do a sort of scorched earth massacre of everyone because I don't know what that does for you. Um, so I'm a bit confused about a lot of that scene. I'm disturbed, and I think we're all right to be disturbed by the alienness. And I think that's one of the things that the film does do. You're immer it's immersive. It is. It gives you a sense of how alien and odd how the the Viking Age was. And I think that's very positive. It creates whole settlements. Um, but there are other things that just jarred me about that mundane settlement world. Like um, there was a lot of animals, but given that. Um, Fjolnir is supposed to be a sheep farmer. I think there's only one shot where I saw white bodies of sheep on the hill behind. And there was no sheep at all. And no fences to contain them. And and that was weird. So there's things like that that really, having seen and excavated and you know, visited many a medieval settlement and Viking settlement, um, the boundaries, the ditches to, I mean, getting ditches are for defense, but ditches are also to keep animals in and out. You know, it's part of the way you do it. You have fence lines and, and ditches. And there's a whole scene about fence building and the sun goes, why am I wasting my time with this dad? And Phil says, you know, show the slaves, you know, so we, we can do it too. You know, I thought it was a really good scene. Yeah, equally, they didn't seem to have many fences. The whole settlement is very Spartan and, you know, 
I, I, again, I think it, it did show how heartless they were, but I think they're not stupid. I think that's the problem is heartless and cruelty and stupidity. Um, I mean, I don't know why you would just randomly kill people. I mean, I, and I think this is the thing. It's, it, unless you're dealing with a genocide scenario, you're trying to show something terribly horrific like the Holocaust or the Rwandan genocide or Armenian genocide. You want to show that there's a, there's a desire to wipe out the people. I don't know why they had to go down the, the, that, in that way. Uh, and I suppose that's the kind of thing that, as, as, as Ashley Archaeologist says here, you know, it's, it's about I feel triggered when I watch these things. And perhaps I just shouldn't be watching these things and caring. But I suppose the point is I have been writing about these, these Viking events because this high fidelity, as um, uh, Dr. C told, told me is the best way to describe it, this high fidelity doesn't necessarily translate into an authentic world for me. And I thought it was very inauthentic. And in, in many ways, I thought the world of the, Viking, the Vikings TV show was more authentic. Uh, not because they they got there's a lot more wrong in that there's a lot more fantastical and ludicrous and out of date in that a lot of stuff is just made up but I found it more authentic because it, you're able to build a world over a whole TV show and you to be honest Eggers it would be impossible for Eggers to do that in a film format but also because um, some key elements were missing like one of the things that I love about Vikings is you get to see the development over six seasons of a town, of an emporium, of a whole urban settlement from its origins. And I'm not saying anything about the way it's represented is perfect or right, but you see trade and raiding centering on major centres, on fjords or near fjords. And you don't really get that from Northmen. You see the, the I don't know if it's supposed to be the Broca Berze or wherever, the, in, the, in the North Atlantic Fjolnir's, um, and the, the king before him, you know, um, you know, um, Ethan Hawke's character—I can't remember his name now. You know, it, it, you know, you see his settlement is on a top of a peninsula, uh, and you get this sense of um, Arvindil. Yes, it's sort of you know Arvindil. You know, this this he's 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 living in this high status hall on top of a big settlement on a hill. Um, but I mean, I don't really get a sense of that, any trade or any you know any commerce connected to that. And while it's still downplayed in Vikings, it is there. That raiding and trading are part of it. So I, I, um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, there's a lot of, of 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 things that made me wonder that why that high fidelity is not quite working. That given the extensive discussions and dialogue with experts, how did it they get things so weird and wrong? And so, yes, I've given you the example of the berserkers. Is there any other bits of the film that anyone's watched they'd like me to talk about? Or they know, they'd like me, any themes they'd like me to uh, discuss? I think I've given you a sense of where my reservations lie um, with that one scene or that opening, that sort of second opener for the first scene of adult Amleth, um, where he's on a boat, the the, the Ulf Hednar's ritual uh, dance, and then the raid on the Slavic village. I mean, is there any other bits or themes that any of you would be interested in my view on? Um, because I can talk about the ritual specialists, the settlements, the raiding, the slave trade, the peoples. I mean, there's lots we could cover here. Um, but is there anything that, I mean, I don't want to put you off going to see the film if you haven't. But um, the claim that it's the best or the most authentic or no, accurate film, that's the phrase they're using, that you can, you can, um, you can see for the, for, for the Viking world is... It's really weird and partial, and I, I, I'm, some of it is really groundbreaking because we haven't seen it before. Other bits I thought were like cut-rate Vikings, really. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Let's talk about the religion. I knew, I knew someone was going. Hello, <laughs> hello. Uh, it's Dylan Sams. Uh, I, I, I know that's not the way your name is, but anyway, yeah, hello. Um, the religion myth, the sense of the enchanted world, I thought was well done. What did you think? Um, that was its strongest element for me. Okay, so right, we see multiple religious ceremonies and private ritual practices, um, including the ritual um, in the chamber beneath the temple between Almvendil and baby or kid, kid Amleth, father and son, and Willem Dafoe's character is supposed to be a sort of shamany priest. So you get that. Then you have later on, you have 
a second ritual specialist in a cave on Iceland who go, who is cross dressed, dressed as a in traditional high status female garb with pairs of oval brooches over nothing. So he's not really cross dressed. He's cross half dressed. He's sort of playing genders. He's tra- you know sort of sort of a bit of a gender bending going on. It's a bit confused, but and then he has the skull, which is a very Hamlet trait. He has the skull of the Willem Dafoe. I think that's supposed to be the skull of Willem Dafoe. Well, the Willem Dafoe looks almost dead already, but he's live, so it was difficult to tell which was live or dead. But anyway, yeah, there's a skull, and you know, and and he uses the skull of the head. Sorry, not head, because it's a mummified head. It's not a skull. To to prophes- to 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 mediate uh, knowledge to Amleth as a, as an adult and to tell him the story. So we have those two ritual characters. Then we have um, old Olga Olga from the Volga. Um, Olga of the Birch Forest, uh, who is a sorceress and says she can break men's minds, but then we never really see any of that mind breaking going on. She 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 puts some some dodgy funguses fungi in a soup, and she allegedly makes a gust of wind appear for the sails of the ship that takes them away from Iceland. But I didn't notice anything else breaking men's minds in what she was doing. I thought it was a bit of a damp squib, in my opinion. I thought she was a complete waste of time as a character. But but she's supposed to be a sorceress, and I didn't see that. And then, oh, sorry, and then you've got the vision. Um, Björk, in um, in the middle of the Slavic uh, uh, temple, uh, appears as a sort of two amleth. And that's the crossover to then the other scenes of the supernatural, which are the visions, the visions of the next world, where you have things like um, he's dying. Now, there's another interaction. There's another actual. I'll come back to that. But then they have the visions. You have the visions of Valkyrie taking him away to Valhalla. And then at the end of the film, that, that scene manifests itself again. There's only one point, I think, and I'm happy to be corrected, where the supernatural world actually manifests itself in the action. Oh, because the Draugr fight in the mound is also in his mind, apparently. And that's the only thing that interacts with him is the ravens that come and peck away and release his bonds. Everything else is is either performance or imagination, we're told. And again, I thought a lot, there's a lot to unpick there that I don't think I could go into. But I thought it was very interesting, very well done, very inspired by the the range of research over the last 20 years on Norse, Old Norse religion, its shamanistic aspects, its gender bending aspects, its... Um, um, soul journeying aspects but I felt actually a lot of that was substandard to the way in which the TV show Vikings has already gone down that route because I really liked the way that Vikings played the game of you're never really being sure whether things are really happening or in the minds of the individuals and this was again and again played out throughout the six seasons and importantly it was played out for both christians and pagans so you had christian visions as well as pagan interactions of course the death of ragnar lothbrook in season four the odin actually goes and visits all the sons of 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 ragnar and there were some of them were in spain some of them are in wherever the hell they are at that point and he goes up to them and, and, and Ivor the Boneless is visited by Odin. And in season six, um, you know, Fitzerg gets to sleep with a goddess. Hey, you know, you get the full, you know, full on range of just slight visions, a shadowy shape in the forest through to getting it off with um, um, Eden. You know, so, you know, but I felt that everything in Northman felt like, oh, we're going to show you something that's clearly a dream now. And that's now it's over. And I thought that was like, all oh, right, OK. So that was just him having a bit of a dream, was it? And I thought that was shite. <laughs> I thought it was very much, um, oh, that didn't happen. Right, OK. You know, the sagas actually talk about people fighting people in, in burial mounds. They actually talk about people going on soul journeys and, you know, and, 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 and transforming into animals. You know, either go down that route or don't bother, in my opinion. I think they just went to a, a really odd... Oh, we're having a vision now. <laughs> and then let's rock back to the, the action. And the whole play that he was supposed to be making the, the Icelandic farmstead people terrified, there was some kind of trollish magic attacking them. I don't know. Maybe I'll need to watch it again, but I thought that didn't work out anyway. He, the idea that he was consciously trying to manipulate their superstitions against them, um, I, I think just didn't work. It was quite clear someone was killing people. 
and then he just and then it all plays it all goes wrong so for me i don't think it worked oh yeah the details of the material culture the ideas it was playing with and you know what let's 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 compare valkyrie shall we the valkyrie shown in the opening scene of vikings in 2013 shows a battlefield somewhere in the around the baltic maybe with bolts uh, or um um no, fins and uh Ragnar sees this vision of almost like bird-like, horrific Valkyrie creatures coming in, claiming the, the dead and raising them up. And then we're shown this shite Wagnerian white horse with feathers and woman just riding on a horse in the air. And I thought, oh my word, if this film had been released in about 1995, just before the 13th Warrior, I thought it would have been really ace. But in 2022, I thought, God, dearie me, substandard. That's my feeling. <laughs> I, I know, I know it's your strongest element. I'm just, I just feel, um, um, I, 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 I feel, um, I feel it was, it was a bit, it was a bit, it was a bit ropey in that regard. And I, I, I just, I just felt that a bit cheated by that. I wanted to see. You know, why, why was he being driven by this prophecy so much? And, you know, that was one of the things I thought. If he was being, if you saw the young Amleth being brought up in this world of superstition where he really believed in the gods, he believed his actions. But I don't really feel he got that. You just feel he was just a bit of a posh prick who wanted to, you know, feel a bit entitled that his dad got killed and needs to get Ruwengi. Uh, I didn't really get a sense that he sort of, this idea of driven by fate really played out. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe that was part of the problem. I don't know. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how to how how to precisely um, justify all of these things. Um, but I would say that there is there is this whole there was a, there was a dynamic there that I don't think quite uh, worked. I didn't feel I was transported to a world where people believed any of this stuff actually happened. You know, um, because obviously the obvious way of doing that would be through trolls and having this idea that trolls were doing this and killing people and. And they said something about that at one point, but it was never played through. So I don't know. So the supernatural elements, I felt, you know, but I suppose maybe maybe you'd like to hear me talking about, unless you have any particular questions, I would, I'd like to quickly talk about the uh, funerary aspects because there, there were three of them as far as I could see. And they're the thing that I'm most interested in is what, how did they show the funerals or the mortuary aspect? Because the TV show Vikings and to a lesser extent, the, Vik the Last Kingdom have allowed audiences to see so many different funerals of different scale and character. And, you know, so what would they do in a short film? Yeah, short, I mean, it's two plus hours. I don't know how long, but, you know, it, it, how, how, how would they show Viking death rituals? And they did so in three ways. And um, I'm happy to be corrected or you tell me there's other things. First one is the idea that a pagan temple would look like a stave church and it was built over a chambered tomb a megalithic chambered tomb so i think the idea was that when um Oven, ovendil and baby amleth or boy amleth go under the floor of the church and into this down this passage and into a chamber they are in a neolithic passage grave I'm happy to be corrected. I haven't seen anyone say that. So that's my interpretation. And I, I, I've, I think the idea came from Terry Gunnell suggesting they should do something like Maze Howe, the Neolithic Passage Grave on Orkney. And I think that might have been the idea that this, and because you could see carving on sort of geometric patterns on the, on carving on the big sort of curbstone. And I think the idea was that, that you are in a, you know, 3,500 BCE, you know, a tomb that's been cleared out and is being used as a cultic space in the Viking Age. Lovely idea. So it's not mortuary in terms of funerary behaviour of, of the Vikings themselves, but that interaction with ancient spaces, ancient places. If I'm right, I, 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 I thumbs up from me. Um, if I'm wrong, well, I, I'm seeing that and it's not there. But um, but I think that's an interesting element. Whatever, you know, um, the second point uh the how the, the draugr in the how he goes to get this ancient sword that will allow him to kill um his his uncle uh Fjolnir. um now it's my, my remembrance may be off but I, I really didn't think it was explained why he needs that sword and i don't understand where that mound was 
with its Vendel period, Valsierda style, um, very late ring sword, ring hilt sword style, uh, sort, of, sort of 7th century in a ship burial. Why was it in Iceland? The whole point is coming from Grettir Saga, where Grettir enters the mound of Car the Old in Norway to retrieve, I think it's the sword of Car the Old. He's going into a mound in Iceland. I mean, Iceland isn't settled in the 7th century. So where was this mound? Um, what was it doing there? And that's the kind of thing that I'm afraid just made me think, this is nonsense. <laughs> anyway, so that is interesting. And he goes in and he, then he fights this Draugr, which is a really cool scene. Uh, but then it's just a dream. So there is no living dead. It's just all in his mind. And I... and and. The other thing that's really bugged me about that scene is the idea that the Draugr is destroyed by moonlight, like a troll in Tol Tolkien, where the, the sun comes up and they're all turned into stone. And I, at least from my memory, I'm happy to be corrected on this, but uh, to my memory, the whole point of Gretis saga when he's fighting the Glam, the, the Draugr, is that the, the Glam is fighting in the hall, like Beowulf fights Grendel, Gretis is fighting Glam in the hall. And... Glam is trying to escape out into the moonlight because he'll be more powerful outside of the hall. And indeed, when they crash through the door, Gretir's strength fails him at the horrific sight of Glam in the moonlight. And he is cursed by Glam that he'll never sleep and he'll never find peace. And before Gretir is able to cut off the head of the of the Draugr and therefore, you know, and put the head between the legs. So for me, they completely screwed up the saga literature. They completely screwed up the, just made it into a dream that Amleth was just fighting an imaginary creature in his mind rather than actually having a fight. And then beyond that, there was also the idea of what, what is this chamber anyway? Because he's dropped down into a chamber that's around the ship. Now, you have good archaeological evidence of chamber graves and chambers within ships. And we know that they're building places and putting the dead seated in these chambers to give the impression the dead living on in a in a small microcosm of their homely elite world with the sacrifice horses, animals, you know, provisions of feasting gear, weapons and so on. You know, that's what we know. That's the core archaeological evidence of high status 10th century burial practice from southern Scandinavia. Right. We don't have it in Iceland, but, you know, we've got that. And we also have the tradition of that going back to the 7th, 8th century of these Viking Valsiada style, Valsiada style uh, ship burials, right? Boat graves. But here there's some kind of chamber that's so big, it's like a hall around the ship, which is just freaking nonsense. So that doesn't make any sense at all. So they screwed that up. And rather than it being he's dropping down to, into an intimate, tight, confined space with this, and suddenly encounters this, this seated figure, and then it starts moving. That would have been much more scary, much more powerful, much more effective. And whether it's played out as a it's a body that is in his mentally tormenting him that he's trying to get the sword away from it, or it is actually a living, it's coming to life and going sort of a Lord of the Rings, you know, King Under the Mountain style. No man shall, you know, you know, and then sort of Aragorn does his thing, you know. But whichever way they played it, I think that would have been much better, a more restricted, confined, terrifying space rather than this acres of space in which. He's fighting this Draugr. So I felt it was, um, they claim to be authentic, but that resembles nothing that we have from the saga literature or the archaeological record. OK, and then finally, the third funeral scene. So we've had a Neolithic chamber under a pagan temple, which is cool, interesting. It doesn't really make sense, but it's good. Then we have the Draugr scene, which again comes from the sagas, comes from the, you know, the archaeological evidence. But it's all ballsed up. And then we have the actual funeral of the son, I can't remember his name, does it really matter, of Fornvir, who's killed um, in his sleep by Amleth in a very cowardly way, it must be said. And they give, they give him a full funeral. Right? And the funeral we see, all I would say is that, you know, the TV show Vikings spent almost one entire episode on the funeral of Lagatha, which was obviously fantastical, ridiculous, elaborate, beyond imagination, the ultimate Viking funeral. And I think, I think everything else, fantastical or realistic, is going to be a second rate compared with that. And the other funerals in the TV show Vikings. What they did was pretty 
standard. They went, oh, Ibn Fadlan, his account of the Rus chief's burial um, cremation on the, Volga, on, 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 the, on the Volga River at the capital of the Bulgars. And we will take that. We'll have a, we have to have a slave girl getting, the, getting stabbed. And we've got to have some kind of animal sacrifice. And they just had them happening at the same time. With a backdrop of a ship in a half-built mound like the artistry constructions of Osibea. So there's a number of issues here, of course. Firstly, they're translating a Norwegian burial rite to Iceland. We do have ship burials from Iceland, but nothing like that, as far as I know. Nothing in terms of the scale and character. Are they sacrificing horses in Iceland in the early 10th century? Yeah, you know, loads of horse sacrifice in funerals. But this eight-year-old lad whack, hacking away at a horse with a, a sword, it's not gonna, that horse is going to take a long time to die, in my opinion. And somehow he, he cuts it like birthday cake. Um, Anyway, um, and they're killing this poor slave girl after she sort of is lifted up to look over the, the threshold as and sees her ancestors in the next world. It's all very much out of 13th Warrior. We're all familiar with that. It's nothing interesting, nothing new. So it was short. It was, I, it was, it was pretty unimaginative. Get mash up Osebea and Ibn Fadlan. It's all been done before. And it's not been, it wasn't particularly good. And the, the most annoying thing was it was conflated into a single scene. In fact, I'll go so far as I hate The Last Kingdom, but The Last Kingdom, season five, the funeral of the Viking bod who gets a ship burial in that, uh, is, that's a better scene. than That's far better than I, I think the Northman's funeral scene was. <laughs> so I'm not making myself any friends here by saying this because I think I am the minority and I thought it was really uninspiring and uh, the funeral scene was, was just, yeah, I've seen that before. They kill slave girls, do they, right? Of course, the evidence, again, this is a problem of creating a trans... Scandinavian model. This is what the Vikings did with the dead. And the, pro the good thing, I'm not saying any of the individual funerals in Vikings are better or more accurate, but at least with Vikings, we show a we've shown a variety. We've shown a vast range of different funerals. And in that regard, I think Vikings is superior because, um, yes, I am wearing the Aarhus Yes, you're um, the non-crazy, crazy cat lady from Aarhus. Yes, 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 this is from your uh, the Moscow Museum. Yes, yes, uh, I got the T-shirt there when I visited in 2011, I think. Yay! So I'm being a bit Danish. <laughs> um, yes, you saw it. Yes, yeah, so we've got the... Uh, uh, some people say it's low-key or Odin. I mean, who knows? But this is from a runestone. There's about five or six runestones with these masks on them, with the horns and the beards, and uh, we don't know what the heck it is. Um, so yes, uh, yes, that was a small world, as they say. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, there were, but, um, but let's get on to let's get on to that. You raised uh, uncertain quest has raised the question of well, I don't want to be that guy, but the characters were well, New Norwegian, but just living in Iceland. Okay, so here we have the issue of populations. Now, you see, this is the problem I face a bit of a dilemma because I spent quite a few years here trying to defend or to support the idea that we should in our modern TV productions be showing something of the diversity and far-reaching connections of the Viking world. And this has led me to recently on TikTok and in my blog defend what some people see as the indefensible that the casting of a woman of colour in a lead role in Vikings Valhalla season one as a, a Jarl um, is, is out, outrageous, ridiculous, fantastical, ludicrous. You can't justify that. It's, it's not accurate. And I said, actually, it is. It, it actually, and I in my recent blog post, which you can read, I made the point that actually it was a. It's a piece of art. This is this is drama. This is TV. This is not a documentary. Uh, this is this. That was a really powerful and interesting choice. And I actually thought she was one of the best characters in the in the series. And it was one of the least problematic things about the series. And um there is a demonstrable i mean we don't have a demonstrable evidence of that individual because it's a fictitious mashup of multiple estrids and multiple hawkins from the historical and archaeological record but there is a there is a case to make to say that is not out of the realm of possibilities and they show people of color as slaves and as slavers as enslaved people and as people doing the enslaving and trading of slaves in that season one of vikings valhalla so with that in mind what do we make of this all-white, the Northman is an all-white production, as far as I could see. Did they need people of colour? No. Should they have included a people of colour? I don't know. Yeah, I think they should 
They're showing the Russian river systems for crying out loud. They're showing they're never going to Scandinavia. Is, I think it was supposed to be Orkney that the scene opens or maybe Western Norway. I don't know. Maybe that's Scandinavia. Um, and then Iceland. Should they have shown people of colour? I think they could have easily and it would have been OK. They did show they had a car actors with Scottish accents to hint at a Celtic presence. So, and of course, one of the lead characters is supposed to be a Slav. She's supposed to be a um, Slavic person from the village, enslaved, and she is a lead character. So it is showing Iceland. Iceland has Slavs. It has Celts or Gaelic-speaking peoples, whatever you want to call them, um, who are there. And it has Norwegians there. So in that sense, it does show diversity. And it does capture something, something rather, nothing radical. It does capture something of the far-flung connections of the Viking world in the Northmen. And certainly Robert Eggers has put a bit of pains to point out the complex melting pot and diverse connections of the Viking world. So I, I think it's a bit cheap to label the Northmen a, as I've seen some people do, um, catnip for white supremacists because i don't think that's really what it's doing but i think given the efforts gone into other shows to attend to that issue pushing the boundaries um, and taking flack for it i was a bit disappointed and i think they could have done something more there that's the way i would phrase it not they had to have people of a particular skin tone but I think they could have indicated more complex um, connections and peoples. But then I could criticise Vikings too, because you know what? Of all of the different connections that they show in the TV show Vikings, they have no Irishmen, no proto-Scottish or Pictish peoples in that TV show. And at least there's a hint that people in Iceland are, are from um, northern and western Britain and Ireland in in, in the Northmen. And I think, therefore, I suppose to be forgiving, it's not uh, uh, to proclaim that Northman is a uni, pol uh, a, uni uh, a single ethnic representation of the Viking Age would be ridiculous. It's not. But does it really play to that and show the diversity? Not as much as it could do. I haven't. I need to catch up with comments to see because I bet that's that's brought out some disagreement. OK, so. OK, I understand what uncertain quest is meaning about the Norwegian burials. Yes, of course, of course, of course, um, the elite and the influence of Norse of Norwegian uh, funerary ritual settlement practices. Yes, of course, I'm not denying that. Absolutely. It makes absolute sense if you're having a person who's an immigrant and exile from Norway as a chieftain in Iceland that he would be performing a Norwegian style funerary rite in general terms. I mean, absolutely. I'm, I, I, I perhaps I don't want to be over picky on that. I just I just felt it went to a pretty predictable place and I was a bit well, there's the slave girl getting jabbed with a knife, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, I suppose. Um, about the going to, uh, circling back to my my comments about uh, uh, rituals and dreams never took it as a dream says dylan sams uh but a different layer but plane of reality betwixt and ple between as it were i agree that that is one way of reading it i would say that i thought that the tv show vikings right the way through to vikings Valhalla, does that better with the use of um i don't know what the term the, the technical term is but blurred camera lenses and focus to give you the sense that the person is interacting with another plane. I love the way they did that in Vikings. When they enter the seer's hut, everything's almost like out of focus. Like you are, where are you in time here? Have you really, are you still in the settlement in the seer's hut or have you gone somewhere else? Is the seer out of our world, out of our plane? And I, I like that much better than I like the way it was shown in the, in, 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 um, in the Northman, if you want my opinion. But yes, I think both TV shows, uh, both TV show and film are showing this messy, complicated nature of religious experiences. Dylan Sam says um, it, it's, it's not giving you a co none of these shows are giving us a coherent pantheon. Um, uh, in the Northmen, we have a cult of Freya in a temple in Iceland. 
Frey, sorry, and you have a Odin worshippers Thor. I don't know what happens to Thor. Um, I see some people with Mjolnir pendants, but uh, on the ship um, at the beginning. But really, I, um, you don't get much sense of a pantheon, and that's good. You know, it's messy, it's confused. I don't mind that. They said Harold Fairhair took over the kingdom from Fjolnir. Yeah, so the idea is that he's 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 an exile. Yes, I've I've just addressed that. I love that you're talking about these shows, so I, I'm, I'm into... Oh, cool. Cool. I'm glad you like it. Thank you. It was fun and artsy, but not accurate or gospel. No, I think that's very true. I enjoyed the journey, but it was not amazing. Yeah, I think that's... I, I, perhaps I, didn't, I, I expected too much of it, but, you know, I just sort of went nowhere, and I just felt, oh, you know. I'm pretty sure the character was Irish because of the hint of hurling techniques. Yeah, I wasn't sure about the hurling and, and the, the Viking games, or whether that's that is supposed to be an Irish thing or not. I, 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 I've been thinking about that, but thank you for pointing that out. Um, I'll have to have a, give that a th further thought and, and so on. Yeah, but I thought that, that would actually, do you know, that scene of the, the game between the thralls was the most, the bit where I became most invested in watching it. Because, you know, you kill him, kill that big, you know, kill. You know, that, was the, that was the funnest bit of the film, I think, um, was that game scene um because you know it was really horrible <laughs> it was more violent than the battles so i loved that bit actually also we need a period uh, show about the pits yes we blimmin well do uncertain quests we need more pits and that's i suppose the beef isn't the problem with all these tv shows we're we're in a rut you know it's great there's another film on the vikings and i think we're getting there with the vikings but please can we have a film set in the early middle ages but set in north africa or set in in the Byzantine world, or set in the Arab, Arab the, the, uh, the Caliphate, or set in uh, Ireland. There's some great comic books um, about Ireland and 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 uh, in the Viking Age or Pictish stuff. And you know, we need more films on this, but it won't have that Hollywood appeal. So I suppose we're stuck with the bloody Vikings from now to the end of time because they're the only way in. They're the they're the gateway drug, as I said at the beginning. But, you know, the gateway is not going to produce more films, sadly. I feel we're stuck with the Vikings. And so the question is, should the Vikings be stuck being the same representative of the same revenge narratives? Or can we just stick with the Vikings to get the money and get the Hollywood films, but just have a good old ghost story or have a, um, a love, a romance? You know, I think we should have Billy Crystal and uh, Meg Ryan, you know, in the Viking age. It'd be great. You know, no, actually, no. You know, you know what I mean? It's, well, now we've got the Vikings as a familiar thing. Can't we do other things with it? Um, yeah, there's so much. Um, you know, um, the um, uh, Cullen and the the, the toy. And yeah, that would be that. There would be some great meathead sort of action stuff. But there's also other things we could do with the period. Um, no, I, yes, one medieval historian. Hello, yes, um, Hamlet, Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet retellings. Um, we don't want any more of them. Thank you very much. I mean, Macbeth is an early, is the only, is early medieval. And we've had enough. So that's, that's the other one, which is the other early medieval, you know, retelling. And I think we've had, I think we've had enough of those, haven't we? There was one, was it, did it have Fassbender in it or something? I mean, he's a great actor, but everything he's in is crap. It's like James McAvoy, great actor, but every film is like a, oh, Anyway, my point is, you know, we, yeah, we need something different, don't we? We need to get out of those and do something different, I feel. Um, yeah, so there's lots of potential. So I suppose the push for the next decade, for me, as an early medieval archaeologist historian, is that the success of the Northmen is that they've taken, they wanted to be authentic. They took on board consultants' guidance, a plenty, it seems. They produced something that I can use for educational purposes even if I hated the film. This is the positive spin. This is where I'm going. I, I am an optimistic guy, really. Um, they've produced something that I, you know, we could that has sparked conversations, but also perhaps we can create a momentum for a more diverse and interesting and varied stories to be set in this early medieval world that aren't the same old thing. And I think it's going to be a brave step, but I think it would be really nice to see if building on this success, we can not say we've done the vikings we don't want another one for another decade thank you very much but we can we can create momentum and passion and interest for films that do something just a little bit more intelligent I and mean, i'm saying that it's, yes it was an arty film but valhalla rising was much better with um um what's his name mickelson isn't it you know 
being a psycho Odin manifestation berserker kicking ass all over the place. Love that film. And it went nowhere. It was mad. It wasn't really a Viking film. But, you know, there is enough variety now to build that momentum to do something actually intelligent and interesting. So for me, it's, it's still a stepping stone film. It's a first realistic Viking film, but I think it's already been surpassed by the Vikings TV show. If we have the next generation, I think, I hope we don't, you know, I hope it doesn't go away. I hope we do have more, but perhaps we can do something more interesting in it. Um, yes, The Norseman is, is a brilliant comedy about, uh, uh, and in many ways, Viking, uh, Viking and, uh, or, or Norseman is cancelled at three seasons, I'm ashamed to say. The third season is brilliant with lots of Game of Thrones parodies thrown in as well. Um, but my point would be that, and that in many ways, that's more advanced and more nuanced and intelligent than the actual Viking dramas and films. But the fact that that went for three seasons at all shows that there is a... a and things like Ragnarok, you know, set in the modern day Norway, you know, in a, you know, in teen sort of teen sort of Buffy, modern updated sort of Buffy, the Vampire Slayer version, but but for Norse gods, you know. I mean, there's lots of different ways we can play with the early Middle Ages in our popular culture, and we shouldn't be too precious about it. And there are other ways in which the, these these themes come through. Um, so um, I, I would say that we, we I don't want to fixate on criticising the Northmen to death because i think you know it's just one of many on a journey that's building our vikingisms but building our interest in the vikings but um you know and I, I mean there's other ones there's other ways it comes out and i want to quickly just mention that of course um the the vikings appear in other tv shows all the time but less obviously did you know i mean has anyone seen season two of the umbrella academy where uh, they have three Swedish assassins. Obviously, it's probably a bit of a um, dodgy stereotype of Swedish assassins, but they are kind of like kind of hitmen of the time, um, you know, academy, a time um, ministry, a ministry of time or whatever it's called, you know, that are basically trying to control the timeline. And they're sent to assassinate the Umbrella Academy um, in the Kennedy era, um, Texas. Uh, and uh, they're basically... Um, the, they, they, they conduct a boat funeral, fire, cremating one of their brothers who's, who's killed on, on, a, on a boat. And it's done in brilliant parody. And it's, it's, it's hilarious. And it's supposed to be funny. And it's just, that's one manifestation of how Vikings appear in other genres. Um, anyone seen Snowpiercer season two, where um, the, um, the lead character picks up a Viking sword to kill uh, uh, because it's a part of a trophy cabinet of the posh... Uh, uh, Wilf, Wilf, Wilford, the uh, the posh uh, guy who controls the train. So it's an act of insurrection using a 1,200 year sword in a post-apocalyptic drama. You know, so you have Vikings appear in all sorts of different ways in our popular culture. It's not just in films about the Vikings. So I, I think that, um, you know, they're, they're, they're everywhere. I'm, I'm sorry, you've ruined it now by mentioning Charlie Hunnam in that, Vi in that King Arthur movie now. I watched that and I've tried to expunge it from my brain. Um, were there, were there, uh, yes, I don't, I don't want to think about that. So let's move on. <laughs> you know, there's, there's lots, there's, there's, it's never going to stop, is it? And at one level, that's, that's good. And there should always be. But the, I suppose that's where the, the other thing that I thought was a bit sad about, um, about um, the TV, the, the film, The Northman, is it was no humour. Even the funny bits, there was, I laughed a lot, actually, but not because it was, I was supposed to be funny. And there was no laugh, there was no playfulness. There was, I mean, the Vikings are silly. You know, the Vikings are silly in our culture, and it, was, it took itself so seriously. Um, and I think little Sandy, the Manx Viking, would have liked a bit more of a, a funny Viking. Um, I think people were supposed to be pleased that everyone wasn't doing the cliches of being drunk in, the, in, in, in a hall and, and all that kind of thing and getting rowdy. But they were pretty sober. They were pretty miserable. There was a few people stabbing themselves in the throat because of hallucinations caused by mushrooms. But there was no fun. There was one sort of group sex scene, which I didn't know what the hell that was about. But that, that, that just felt like that was perhaps more traumatic than, than, than playful or fun. I thought the whole thing was a, a, a dreadful, really. Greetings from Spain. Hello. Um, yeah, it, was all very, it was all very serious. I want a bit more Viking fun. 
I want Vikings that do Roger Moore style James Bond scene, you know, lines after he's uh, split someone's skull open here. That'll give him a headache. You know, I want more of that. You know, we need a bit more sort of. The Vikings did have a good laugh, and that's certainly something we have. Sort of ironic comments, or um, you'll be you'll be remembering your, your your knee will hurt in the morning as you cut your their legs off or something. You know, we needed a bit more of that, I think, really. Um, yes, we were just talking about that 1930s news network. We were just talking about the uh, the Norseman uh, TV show and how you know we need that as well as the uh, perhaps the more serious and macho vikings and i thought it was just a macho headache that's the other problem with the film it was just there's too much testosterone and not enough fun <laughs> but um is there anything i mean that's that's my overall impression and i'm sorry if that's a a bit eclectic i mean um I, but i hope you don't you get a sense of where i'm coming from there's not a disaster from a general sense but i thought it was such a missed opportunity that's why i said i hated it <laughs> because I just felt it's just missed everything and it just drove me crazy. Um, uh, yeah, and there's the Monty Python Vikings. Uh, um, I've done a blog post about them, about Monty Python Vikings, I think. Um, I think they're very important. Or maybe I did a TikTok about them. Yeah, there's a TikTok actually. <laughs> um, but we need we need a film. I think if there was, if we had the Northman, but at 10 points, we had a, a person come on and go, and here's a joke. <laughs> You know, something. What we need is Tank Tongman, who's on obviously uh, doing his weight training. He should he should have come in and done. Hello, everybody. Let's do some push-ups with a shield. You know, I think that would have really broken the lightened it up a bit and made me enjoy the film a bit more. <laughs> you know, ha I see you're getting a bit depressed with all the violence. Let's do some exercises. <laughs> I think that would have really worked. Um, but anyway, that's. Uh, I think the future is TikTok length, length films, isn't it? Or two minutes or three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes there's do no harm yes <laughs> yeah, the tank would be great wouldn't it but i think we we also need we also need the the um the the sort of um the ability on tiktok to uh do sort of commentaries on films you know and just sort of all sit along watching it together and just going what, what what's going on here and i think that would be great viewing watching us react or reaction things you know like these tv shows you know but yeah, I was I was trying to be quiet in a in a theatre in a cinema, and I usually was. I'm the type of guy that gets really annoyed when people make noise in cinemas, and yet I was the noisiest person in the cinema on Wednesday night because I was just going, <laughs> you know, yeah, group watch parties on TikTok, yeah. But I was I was really I was trying not to make noise, but I was just going, oh my god, oh no, they're not doing that. No, what's going on now? Oh please, no. Um, but yeah, but then I remember I'm such a shit. I remember telling a woman off for laughing in the death scene in Titanic when I saw it in the cinema back in 1997, 98, and then realising that she was actually crying you know, because Leo was dying. You know, and I, I thought she was laughing away. I thought, I thought, you know, I don't really, um, the film was, I, I, film wasn't to my taste, but I, I don't like people making noise. I thought she was actually laughing. <laughs> and I sort of kicked her chair and shut up. And I realised the woman in front was actually, she was actually sobbing away. So I felt rather bad about that. <laughs> anyway, you don't want to hear enough about that type of thing, really. All my embarrassing moments in cinemas past. <laughs> I don't throw popcorn at people or anything. But I don't know. It leaves me in a quandary. Should I actually bother going to see these films anymore? Maybe I'm just too old and miserable for it all. You know. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, I kind of like, I like a, I, I'm waiting for the next one and what might come out. But I can certainly think, I think I think one thing is certain, no one's ever going to ask me to be a historical consultant on any of these films. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be a, a long time before anyone asks my opinion, because I'll just ruin it for everyone. Or, I, you know, it depends on the day. Some days I go, oh, this is all wrong. You can't do any of this. On other days I just go, yeah, and put in a couple of dragons. Yeah, they had those. And just see what they do. <laughs> and then, if, you know, the... My reputation's already screwed, so, you know, we'll see. You know, when, when the, everyone castigates the historical consultants, I'll just go, yeah, that was me. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> they paid me. <laughs> maybe I should avoid Viking movies. Yes, maybe I should. Well, thank you for your time. Unless you have any other questions you'd like to throw at me, it's been wonderful having a chat with you all about uh, things Viking film and the Northman. I, th I don't know what the box office takings of the film are going to be and whether it will be seen as a success. I've seen a lot of archaeologists saying they like the immersive world, they like the material culture, uh, but they didn't think it was a very good film. 
<laughs> and I think that's where I'm going to, but I'm also saying that I thought that the material culture was not actively used in an effective way. I think it was very much just there and not really doing much apart from the sword, the ancestral sword. But even that just seemed a bit arbitrary. It didn't come from his dad or it didn't come from anywhere. I don't really understand what it was supposed to be. Um, so I think, yeah, and someone earlier said it's 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 supposed to be from you know it's it's it's, it's you know it's from um Evera saga and uh, um and, and you know but but you know i don't know <laughs> let's have more of them i want Egil saga with Egil played by who who would play Egil in hollywood who do we want to play um ryan reynolds <laughs> no no maybe not um Maybe something. Maybe maybe John Goodman as an old Agil, and and is he still going, John Goodman? Maybe as a young Agil, I don't know who. <laughs> I have to think about this one. We need to have, we need to make up new Viking films. We need to team. We need to crowd source. Um. Oh, you didn't knew a guy who did the historical consulting on Sharp. Wow, fantastic. You know, I think I think you know well, they're never going to get everything right, but I think it gives us stuff to talk about and. You know, well, the thing with my, with my students is that I show them this. Go, everyone saw the Northmen. We can talk about this in class now. And they go, and that two hands go up. Yeah, we saw them. The rest of the class go, oh, I didn't see that. So you could, there's no common ground anymore. No one's all been to the cinema and seen the same things. But you try your best, and you you try you try to try to give you know commentary on these things and link into pop culture. And and I don't think it's just fluff. And that's the other thing I would like to finish off is I don't think this is just added extra. I think this really matters because if we're trying to engage people in in local excavations, in local heritage. If you want people to care about their local um, landscape and the historic sites within it and the buildings and the monuments and the museums, and given how grossly underfunded, at least in the UK, our museums and our governmental sector archaeologists are, you know, while it's uh, none of the money f filters down from films, you know, I think it's a way of energising and re-energising interest in, you know, um, yeah, in, in, engaging in, interest in in the in the in the in the past. So I, it's not to be. I don't. I don't. I'm not snoo, snoo, snobby about it. I think it's absolutely integral to having these conversations. Is my back okay? Yes, it is. Uh, I, I I don't know. I think at some point I've had problems with my back, but I don't know what's the reference to. But yes, I'm I'm all right. Thank you. Um, oh, his back okay. Oh, his, right. Okay. So I'm missing the conversation. <laughs> right. Well, if that's everything, I shall say good night. Have a great evening. And I shall be releasing some more videos very soon. More sites I've been going to. More opinions on things like I've got on various archaeological matters. And uh, drop me any questions you have because I've got a few pending. But uh, any questions you have about the Northmen, about Vikings, Oh, yeah. And the other thing, I've now got playlists, of course, and I've been avidly going back over my past video content on TikTok and linking them into playlists. I've only got back to last summer, so I've still got another year and a bit to go. Um, hey, there's another thing I wanted to say. Do you know what? This is I've been two years on TikTok, I think, as of today or tomorrow. I can't remember. Or maybe yesterday. But two years, two whole bloody years of doing videos on this channel. So, yeah, hey. So hail all hail the Northman and yay me for two years of, of, of my insanity spewed onto video for all the world to see. So with that all in mind, um, oh, oh, no, you missed it. Archaeology Bay. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to put this on YouTube. I'll put this on YouTube and you can all watch it at your leisure if anyone ever watches these things. But anyway, I, I better go. But thank you so much. Farewell. And uh, yeah, two years, two years down. Coming up to 16k followers. Woohoo. That's fame. I, I should sign autographs. At least send them to myself. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for all the support and kindness. And uh, talk again soon. I'll do a 16k TikTok live, maybe, whenever that happens. Take care. Bye now. For relaxing times, make it Archeodesk time.